Well, good morning. Welcome to another devotional time with me, Pastor Dennis Roxer, and the pastoral staff at Duluth Bible Church. I trust that these devotional messages have pointed you to the Lord, encouraged you to have a divine viewpoint on the various issues we are addressing, and to walk by faith and not by sight, especially during this coronavirus time. And yet the principles we're covering are applicable at any time, any difficulties, any trials, any sufferings that we're experiencing. And as a result, they can be applying to your life. In fact, I've had several trials this very week, and these principles have come in very helpful regarding this. Now, as I think of this, I would like to today continue our series on how. How should I respond to the suffering and trials in my life? We've looked already at why there are suffering and trials. We've looked at what God is seeking to accomplish through them. And now we are looking at how. How should I respond to the suffering and the trials that I face in life? And we all face them. We face challenges every day. Opportunities to trust the Lord, opportunities to grow, opportunities to serve Him, opportunities to see the faithfulness of God. And indeed, we are presently in one as well. Even as I think of that, I can't help but think of the fact that, that we as believers, again, are to walk by faith and not by sight. And as I think of that, and in light of the trials that we face, we are to either respond by faith, embracing God's perspective, trusting him and then obeying, or we can react after our flesh. And there are many fleshly reactions, whether unbelief, pride, pity, so forth, so forth, so forth, frustration. In fact, even today, I found myself in a trial in which I started to react. I lost my wallet, and as you know, a, a wallet is a male purse. What women put in a purse, we put in a wallet oftentimes. And as a result, there were credit cards and some cash and various important things that are in that wallet. And, and I looked for it, and there it was. It was gone. I said, oh, man, what happened to that wallet? You know, I sure hope I didn't drop it in the parking lot. Did someone pick it up? And your mind starts racing, and... and it, this was an opportunity to respond now. You know, and there's nothing wrong with getting a little excited and so forth, but would I re respond or would I react? Well, I just started reacting. And I decided to drive home and look on the couch because I was sitting with Sarah this morning and uh, in, or yesterday morning. And in doing so, I uh, sure enough, there it was. And I was like, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. But then I stopped and asked myself, boy, but I was really reacting, wasn't I? And uh, everything was kind of in hyper speed and motions were running high and I didn't even check in with the Lord really. I might have prayed to ask the Lord to show me where that wallet was and I think I did, but, but overall I was just operating out of the flesh. And then I thought, here I am gonna preach on trials. And that's the thing about Things I preach on, oftentimes, the very subject I'm preaching on, the Lord has to run me through the meat grinder personally and appropriate some of these things in order to preach more effectively to you. It's like the lady who came up to me one day and she said, Pastor, would you quit preaching on trials? That's all I'm having. And I said, okay, well, I'm almost done with the series, but cheer up, uh, the next series is on temptations. <laughs> and we laughed because I was in James 1. And the first 12 verses are on trials, and verse 13 and following are on temptations. Well, I'm not preaching on temptations today, but what I am preaching on is how. How does the Lord want you to respond and not react in your present sufferings and trials? And we've seen in our previous studies that, number one, we are to embrace a positive perspective, knowing the benefits of trials in your life. We're to count it all joy when we are faced with trial, because we know something, that these trials are designed with a purpose, 
to mature us. They're to benefit us. They're to make us more like Jesus Christ. Secondly, we should respond and not react. And in responding, we should ask the Lord for wisdom. How to view and respond practically in this situation. If any of you lack wisdom in the context of suffering, trials, let them ask of God. Let's ask the Lord to show us, is this deserved or undeserved? Ask the Lord to show us. Now, here's the principle. How is this best carried out? Is this something that's in my control that I should act upon? Or is just something I have to just turn over totally to you and not act at all? In either case, the Lord wants our attention. He wants us to pray for wisdom. And he says, if we're willing to do that in faith, he's willing to answer because he's a generous giver. Thirdly, we looked at last time, sometimes we're to be angry at times, but not sin or give place to the devil. That's what Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry is actually a command, but it's qualified very quickly and do not sin. There is a place for righteous anger when unrighteous acts of violating the will of God and others have been adversely affected. There's a place for righteous anger. But don't sin, don't take it into your own hands, and don't let the sun go down on your wrath, deal with it in a timely fashion, nor give place to the devil by getting bitter and so forth and so forth, lest you give him a beachhead in your life. So that is a wrong reaction and a right reaction, a response, I should say, to be angry and do not sin. A fourth one that I'd like to introduce today is found in 1 Peter, and it's to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a verbal witness of your faith and hope in Christ. Now, 1 Peter deals with the issue of suffering for the Savior, suffering and doing the will of God. And in 1 Peter 3, in verse 14, he says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, which is for the right reason, it's, it's uh, undeserved suffering. We didn't do anything wrong to deserve it. In fact, we did something right. We sought to do the will of God. If that's the case, you truly are blessed to be able to suffer for Jesus Christ's sake. And do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Notice two wrong reactions. One, be afraid. Two, be troubled. To be afraid means just that, and to be troubled means to be mentally agitated and emotionally disturbed. Kind of interesting, it's the very two phrases that were used by our Lord when he said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled nor afraid. Instead, he wants to give us the peace that passes all understanding. And we're supposed to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You are to set him apart, as it were. And say, in essence, Lord, you are in control. You are the Lord that bought me with a price. You are the Lord God, still on the throne. And I'm just going to set you apart to do your will. You have the right of way in my thinking. And always be ready to give a defense, an apologia, a verbal witness or defense. Be prepared. And by the way, be able to do that to be able to explain to someone the gospel and why you're suffering, why you're willing to suffer, and why you're responding the way you are in the trial you're facing. Because there will be people who ask you. On the one hand, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In this particular case, in the context of suffering, he's saying, in essence, be prepared because there are people who are going to ask you, how are you dealing with the coronavirus? Because frankly, a lot of people are shook. Their world is shaken. They're finding, trying to find peace through their circumstances. And you see, the peace of God, the passive understanding, is independent from our circumstances because we're casting our cares on the Lord. We're relying on him in the trial. So be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you and do it with meekness, humility, and fear, a reverence towards God and a respect towards others. Do it respectfully. Don't put them down for asking. Don't shame them, as it were. 
do it in a kind, loving, but firm way. Having a good conscience, and it's very important that we have a good conscience, that the dash light of our minds isn't flashing with guilt, genuine guilt, not false guilt, but genuine guilt, because what we where why we're suffering is because we did what was wrong. But be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as an evildoer. To be defamed means they run your reputation through the mud, and they claim that you are an evildoer, you violated the law, you're a criminal, you deserve the suffering you experience. And in fact, there are times when you have to obey God rather than man. And in the early church, they would not say Caesar is Lord. They would not pledge allegiance to him. And therefore they were defamed as an evildoer. You aren't really for the emperor. You're not really for the, you're not really again for the empire. You're not willing to work together. Who do you think you are? And indeed we must be careful that we have a good conscience in what we're doing, but at times expect that kind of thing when we're doing what's right. You know, when I was first saved and decided to walk with the Lord, many of my peers thought so young to have lost his mind. What in the world has got into Rocky? And you see, dear friends, that's going to happen. And so you need to have a good conscience that when they defame you as an evildoer, those may be ashamed who revile your good conduct in Christ. Because what they say about you doesn't really line up with how you're conducting yourself, nor how you are responding in the situation. And then he goes on to say, for it is better if it is the will of God. If God, if God chooses for you to suffer, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, sometimes doing good, doing what's right before the Lord, you suffer sometimes even from carnal believers who don't like the decision you have made. But it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. If you suffer for doing evil, you deserved it. You just got what was coming. But if you suffer for doing good, that's a whole different story. And as we think of the person who suffered in doing what was right, in fulfilling the will of God, the greatest example of that is found in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once. For what? For sins. For who? The just for the unjust. For why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And so we see here that we are to have a mind that's willing to do the will of God, even if it means suffering. And in doing so, we're to be prepared to give a verbal proclamation of the gospel and the hope we have in Christ. Now, in light of the coronavirus, in light of people being alarmed or so forth and so forth, this is a wonderful opportunity for us as believers to share the gospel, to share how we know where we're going when we die that we're going to heaven because Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, and we've received eternal life as a gift, not by works, law, or ritual. It's a great opportunity to share that we're, we are at peace in the meantime because God has a plan for our life. And while we're not foolish and we are taking precautions and so forth and so forth, that we're very confident that if God wants us to get this, we, he'll give us the grace to deal with it or he'll bring us home. And you know, when you have that kind of thinking, people stand up and notice. They'll say, that's really different. That seems very calming. You surely seem to have stability while I'm unstable. Again, what is the key to that? And you give them the gospel. By the way, have you given anyone the gospel during this time? You shared anyone a link of a, like what the new coronavirus cannot do? Have you reached out to other people or are you just in your little box at home? And just because you're at home, you don't have to have the mentality, we've got four no more shut the door, even though there's social distancing. You can still reach out to people in many, many ways. And I certainly hope that you're willing to do that. 
because God wants to use you as an ambassador for Christ. And as I've said before, if the coronavirus doesn't get you, something else is going to get you. And one of the best ways to redeem the time and the opportunities God gives you to serve him is to walk by faith, be in prayer. This is a great time to devote much more time to prayer than Netflix. And as a result, be willing to think of someone. Why don't you right now pray and think, who could the Lord use me with at this time? What unbelievers are out there that I know, people that maybe are shook that I could pick up the phone and call them. I could Zoom them. I could send them an email. I could send them a verse. I could reach out and see how they're doing. See if there's a need. Because you see, we're a testimony both by our lip and by our life. And there are certain things we could do. We could drop something off at someone's house, leave it on the porch, and so thus meet a need. We could, again, reach out to them in various ways. And indeed, while we want to minister to people, maybe even physically at this time, maybe financially at this time, to minister to the body but fail to minister to the soul means that you may meet a physical need, but a bigger need has been missed, an opportunity to give them the gospel. And while you don't want to slam, you know, open the door, as it were, and slam the gospel down them, on the other hand, why don't you pray? Pray about some of these people. Pray about reaching out to them. And then be the answer to your prayers and trust the Lord to give you what you need to be able to present the gospel to them. And so on the one hand, we're willing to go. We're an ambassador for Christ. On the other hand, we're prepared when they ask us, how are you coping with this? You seem to be calm. And let's be ready to give them the wonderful good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and share with them how they can find first peace with God Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, not only the peace with God, but that they could find also the peace of God that passes all understanding. And so, going back to my original point, or will we respond, or will we react? And you know, when you react like I did today, just bow your head and Tell the Lord I reacted. Lord, I just sinned there. I, I didn't turn to you and I didn't trust you. I just reacted after my flesh. And I used 1 John 1, 9, confess my sin, claim his forgiveness, gave it over to the Lord and kept moving. Got my eyes back on Jesus Christ and made the most of the rest of the day instead of wallowing in my failure, focusing on myself kicking myself in the dirt of how I reacted. By the grace of God, I haven't reacted more than I have. Because in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. But so thankful as we walk in the spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. As we walk by faith, we can respond instead of react. And we can even be a good witness for Christ. May indeed that be true of you today. Thank you so much for listening to me today and trust that this could have been an encouraging devotional for you. Kurt's up on Thursday. I will be back on Friday and Saturday sharing more how you and I can respond in the trials and sufferings in our life. God bless.